August, and Thursday is the first day of September. So this is kind of an important week, and of course next week we'll be celebrating Labor Day a week from today. Uh, it is a pleasure to be with you for the start of another week of programming here at the Virtual Center. Uh, our weather is is summer-like, as I'm sure it is for many folks. Um, the wildfires continue to uh, to eat up the West, and uh, saw an interesting presentation on that last night. They're apparently beginning to look seriously at the idea that maybe fighting all these fires is creating part of the problem because what they're doing is salvaging uh, some of uh, the fuel that later fires feed on. And so basically the argument is maybe they need to be a little bit more scrupulous, a little bit more careful in, in, in terms of which fires they, they, they fight and which ones they don't and that kind of thing. But uh, that's, you know, that's, that's a, a major problem, obviously. One of the things that and I'm sure many of you have seen the results of this but, uh, uh, or, the, or seen this information, it's been, uh, rap it's been spread all over the place. That this past July is one of the warmest months on record, and I think August is probably going to top that. Um, and uh, and yet we still have people who deny, uh, not only deny climate change, deny the numbers. Uh, if you if you uh, recreate the numbers that temperatures have reached each day, and you point out numerically. That, the, that this is indeed the hottest month ever, um, many people will just challenge the numbers. Uh, so you know, that's what we're in. That's when, that's when your belief system overtakes your, your, your common sense and, and, and sense of reasoning. Ironically, that's what we're going to be into today for the bulk of our, the bulk of our program. But first of all, I'd like to uh, take care of some of the housekeeping uh, op uh, duties or operations that we usually do at the beginning of every program. And that is first to welcome you and secondly to uh, reiterate how important you are and your ideas are to this program, to this entire effort. We have a phone number, and the purpose of that number is to give you an opportunity to get on the air and share your thoughts, questions, ideas, concerns, uh, hopes, fears, whatever they might be, on some of the issues we're talking about, which are pretty large, it seems to me, um, with our other listeners. Uh, obviously, I look forward to hearing from them from you, but what I want to emphasize is that our other listeners do as well. And part of the mission of this entire effort here at the Virtual Center is to air differing opinions and points of view on some of these key issues of our times. Uh, and especially those ideas and issues which devolve back to our founders and to the, to the founding documents on which this republic is based. Our phone number is area code 304-663-4676, 304-663-4676. If you'd like to share your thoughts with me in an email, I would love to hear from you. My email address is waobrien906 at gmail.com. <coughs> Again, that's W A O'Brien, O B R I E N, 906 at gmail.com. And once again, I want to emphasize the existence of our Facebook page. Uh, we've had it now for in excess of six months. I can't remember exactly when we began it, but it was well over six months ago. And it continues to get a lot of a lot of views and a lot of likes and and reactions and those kinds of things. So I really do believe that the purpose of the Facebook page, which was to uh, basically create another avenue uh, whereby we can share our thoughts and share our ideas. Um, I think it's going very well um, over the last three or four days. I've put a number of items on the Facebook page. Many of them connected to links to particular articles 
that I thought I uh, had something important to say. And I basically made the determination by putting him on our Facebook page that those of you who regularly look at our Facebook page would appreciate seeing them there as well. In fact, uh, once we get this uh, uh, basic information out of the way, one of the first items I want to mention is a Facebook entry that I put on there a day or two ago. Uh, if you are a regular user of Facebook, uh, all you need to do is go to Facebook.com and in the search box at the top of the home page, just type in the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution and you will be into our Facebook page. So again, whether you choose to call in to the program when we're on the air live, whether you choose to drop me an email, or whether indeed you would com communicate with us through Facebook, I welcome, I solicit your input, and I'll do the very best I can do to, to share your thoughts and your ideas with other people if you're not comfortable presenting them yourself. But I do invite you to do that and, and uh, make yourself heard. I will say uh, that I did receive this mor just this morning a, an email uh, from a regular listener who is based in Iowa. Uh, and um, I, I appreciated so much getting this, this email. It was very, very kind. Uh, the author, the listener, uh, made some, some very, very generous comments about the program and about me. And I appreciate very, very much. Uh, him doing that. Um, also, the listener was very interested in something that I've mentioned a couple of times here on the Virtual Center. And now that I'm into it, I think I'll mention it yet again. And that is that a longtime friend and colleague of mine uh, uh, who I went to graduate school with. So I have known Bob uh, since the, since 1966, when I first started graduate school after graduating from college, um, I was in a graduate dorm at the University of Wisconsin, and my friend Bob was in a room down the hall, uh, also a historian. I was majoring in revolution and constitution, and so consequently, my major advisor, or my major professor, was Merrill Jensen, who was a revolution scholar. I've talked about him many times. Excuse me, I've got a little bit of the sniffles here. Bob was a colonialist, and uh, he was studying under the tutelage of uh, David Lovejoy, who was a very, very prominent colonial historian who passed away a few years ago. And Bob and Professor Lovejoy became very, very good friends. Uh, and uh, after he received his doctoral degree, uh, uh, Bob uh, secured an appointment teaching uh, America, early American history uh, in Northern England at Lancaster University. And so for 25 years, Bob and his wife uh, lived in England and only came back to the States, oh, I guess about 12, 13 years ago. And we, connect, we reconnected after all of those years, and we've been, stayed fairly close since. The point is that my friend Bob, whose last name is Bliss, B-L-I-S-S, -S, what an absolutely fabulous name, uh, Bob Bliss. But anyway, Bob uh, writes a daily uh, blog, if you will, on the Internet. And each day he takes a birthday of someone who would be, who was born on that particular day, and puts together a paragraph about the circumstances or the situation which made that particular individual prominent. Bob has been doing this for several years. Uh, I don't know exactly how long. My guess is seven or eight years. It could be even more than that. And uh, is very, very eager to share what he does each day uh, with those who are interested. And this particular email of this morning was interested in getting that email address so that he could get place, uh, have his name or his email address put on the list of those who received the daily briefing from Bob Bliss. Um, and again, if if any of you out there would like to get on that list, then then by all means, uh, uh, just drop me an email uh, at waobrian906 at gmail dot com, and I'll be glad to give you Bob's name and uh, his email address. 
Uh, I've got friends, uh, close friends of mine, my brother and various other people at Rob Bob's mailing list. And when I when I when I was put my name on the on Bob's list, which is a few years ago, there were probably 35 or 40 names. Now it's several hundred. I'm guessing it's in excess of a thousand. I don't know exactly how many names are on the list, but it's fairly huge. Uh, so uh, all that all that Bob would do would be would be to put your name on there and that email goes out each day to the people whose names are on that on that mailing list um, and I, I find the the pieces the entries that Bob done to, does to be very very interesting very very informative uh, I don't know how he does it uh, Sundays holidays makes no difference I, I spent some time uh, visiting with Bob uh, a couple of times over the last few years, and I've seen the way he operates. And when he gets up in the morning, he's one of those early risers. The first thing he does is to write that day's blurb, whatever it happens to be. And it never he never fails. It's there every single day. And uh, many of the things that are on there uh, are – individuals about individuals places and issues that I'm not as familiar with as perhaps I ought to be because Bob draws on the 25 it draws on the 25 years he spent in England and so the basically then uh, he's he's giving us insights into individuals and historical pieces of information that I really didn't know anything about and I find them fascinating and most of the people whose name uh whose names I have asked Bob to put on the list, uh, agree that, uh, so that what you, you know, what, some of those blurbs are absolutely fascinating. Uh, so again, uh, I, I mentioned that uh, because our emailer this morning requested that his name be placed on that particular list. And I, I appreciated that. I think Bob will appreciate it as, as well. As I mentioned, uh, there are a number of issues and things that uh, that I've been involved in in recent days, uh, and I wanted to share with you. And Monday tends to be, uh, and it's not planned by any stretch, but frequently because there's a five-day hi hiatus between our final program on Wednesdays and our first program after that the following Monday, um, that Monday tends to be what I've gotten to call a this, that, and the other day. Um, where I try to bring folks up to speed on particular issues or things that have been of particular interest to me, and I'm guessing that they would be of interest to you as well. And I have three or four of those issues uh, that many of them that I spent time on over the last three or four days. Uh, and then I would like to uh, pick up on an issue that we talked about last Wednesday, and that is the research of Lawrence Kohlberg and Lawrence Kohlberg's uh, stages of moral development. Uh, this is an issue that we've dealt with some time ago here at the Virtual Center, but I really think that more and more it becomes appropriate. And as I mentioned at the end of our program on Wednesday, one of the issues that seems to make Kohlberg's research um, of interest to me again is that we have spent so much time here at the virtual center on the idea of what Jefferson called the moral sense what the enlightenment writers and theorists referred to as the moral sense the idea that man is indeed as opposed to what John Locke wrote uh, in the early 18th century um, if you remember Locke argued that man that everything that man knows and is is a product of his environment that man is not born knowing anything that there really aren't innate pieces of information or innate knowledge or inklings or things that people naturally know um, that was Locke's position so in, in fact I think we made the point here at the virtual center that one of the important issues about those who tried to link Thomas Jefferson and John Locke, and of course we spent a lot of time on that with the Declaration of Independence, uh, and those who believe 
that Jefferson's Declaration of Independence is predominantly Lockean. We talked over and over again about that particular issue. But one of the major issues that Jefferson and the Enlightenment thinkers differed with Locke on was this issue of the moral sense. Jefferson and the Enlightenment philosophers believed that man is indeed born with a conscience, that man's knowledge of right and wrong, good and bad, is innate, that man is born knowing right from wrong without necessarily having to be taught it. And consequently, that challenges John Locke's argument that when man comes into this world, when man is born, he comes into this world as with a so-called tabula rasa, blank slate, and that it's the experiences that man, the things that man is exposed to and the experiences that are recorded on that blank slate that determine what this particular human being is going to be, is going to believe, and how that individual is going to behave. Jefferson took issue with that particular issue, uh, with that particular finding of John Locke. So the, the point I would make is that when people go to great lengths to link Jefferson and John Locke, this particular position on the tabula rasa uh, is, uh, creates a problem for many of these folks because on it, Jefferson and John Locke are on opposite sides of the fence from each other, so, so, to, so to speak. But back to Kohlberg and the, mor and the, moral set, uh, the idea of moral development. Um, if, as we talked about, Jefferson and many of the other people, founders in the 18th century, uh, believed in the idea of a moral sense, and those well-educated uh, would, because many of the colleges and universities in 18th century America were staffed with people, with professors who had been steeped in the moral philosophies and the political philosophy of writers like David Hume and and uh, Adam Smith and Francis Hutcheson and many of the other more prominent Enlightenment thinkers. Jefferson was one. Madison was another at Princeton University. And we've talked about the fact that when Jefferson w w attended Princeton, the president of Princeton was Reverend L Witherspoon, who was a direct graduate of the Scottish universities. And so basically, he brought that entire Scottish Enlightenment background to Princeton. And Madison spent all of those years, those formative years at Princeton, being taught by people who had been steeped in the writings of Hume and the others. So the point is that with the idea of the moral sense, Jefferson obviously believed that man innately knew the difference between right and wrong. We know that, the, that our Constitution and the interpretation of that Constitution that has come down to us is predominantly driven by an interpretation of human nature which denies the existence of a moral sense. Basically, the driving philosophy of human nature that guides the Constitution and its interpretation is the idea that man is selfish, self-interested, and basically will do whatever feeds that particular self-interest. As Madison said in Federalist Number 10, um, the, the idea of faction is sown into the nature of man. And the implication is self-interest is going to govern human behavior, not conscience. And if we'll recall, Madison himself spent time in several of the Federalist tape papers addressing this particular issue and talking about the extent to which even he 
despite Federalist number 10, Federalist number 51, and the others that were based on the idea of factions as being sown into the nature of man, Madison himself was committed to the idea of a moral sense. Madison's idea of faction was driven primarily by what happens to man when he gets into groups, factions, of like-thinking people. Madison makes quite a distinction between man alone in his own closet, to use Madison's words, and man as the member of an organized faction. Madison argues that factionalism, self-interest, will dominate man's behavior when he organizes with other people who believe the same thing. Madison then makes a clear distinction between the difference between man in isolation and man as a member of an organized group. And, and that's basically Madison's way of handling this idea of the moral sense along with his, his concern about factions as being the major danger to Republican forms of government, to popular forms of government. Kohlberg's idea of, the, of moral development is a cognitive idea. It's based exclusively on reason, on rationalism, on common sense on developing one's cognitive abilities to reason and think through issues and to reach the conclusions that seem to make the most sense. And what Kohlberg's research is based upon is that as man grows from being a young child into the teen years and finally into adulthood, the level of moral development, the level of the depth at which man cognitively can think and reason changes. And consequently, Kohlberg's idea that it identifies six different levels of cognitive development, each of them a little deeper, a little bit more sophisticated than the others. I would suggest, and this is the reason I want to spend a little bit of time on Kohlberg today, but not right away. As I say, there's a couple of issues I'd like to deal with first. But I would like to deal with the issue with Kohlberg in the context of the moral sense. The idea of man ha having an innate conscience, an innate sense of right and wrong. I would argue that because this idea of the moral sense over the years has been repressed in our schools, in the way our, our founding documents are interpreted and all the rest of it, Jefferson's commitment to the idea of the moral sense is not that prominent. Rather, what is prominent is the extent to which Jefferson's Declaration of Independence is directly linked to, to the ideas of John Locke and to Locke's ideas of property and the idea of property as a natural right in the state of nature. We talked about this before here at the Virtual Center. This, I believe, is a political choice. It is a political decision over the years that leaders of this country have made to the point that Jefferson's commitment to the idea of a moral sense, to the idea that man's sense of conscience, sense of right and wrong, is innate, has been repressed. To the point that when we look to improve behavior, human behavior, when we look to find ways to counter or to combat crime, drug abuse, uh, various kinds of, of abuse, discrimination, bigotry, and all the rest of it, we tend to look for answers in the area of cognitive development. 
because the idea that there's an innate sense of right and wrong within all of us is not generally part of our cultural makeup. It has been repressed over the years. And I think one of the ways I explained it here in, 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 at the Virtual Center in a previous program from several months ago was the idea that it appears that those people in our society who had the kind of position, wealth, and influence that gave them the opportunities to do this made choices. And that choice was to look at our constitutional system and the interpretation of that system without giving credibility to the idea of a moral sense at all. The idea that man's behavior was totally controlled by rational decision making. Therefore, any solutions or any answers to human behavior gone awry, we have tended to assume needed to be rational decisions. They needed to be cognitive decisions. I would argue that at base, liberals tend to be committed to this idea of the existence of a moral sense, of an innate sense of goodness within man. Much of our philosophy, much of our literature has focused on this. The idea of romanticism, the idea of transcendentalism, the writings of Emerson, Thoreau, and all the rest of it, all the rest of those writers, Cooper and others, was based on the idea that there is this moral sense of goodness within all of us. It is repressed by the society around it, sometimes to the point that it doesn't even exist anymore, we believe. But the fact of the matter is it does. And some of the most threatening literature and philosophy ever written in this nation is based on the idea that it's there. People who subscribe to it tend to be considered radicals, dreamers, um, not, not uh, I was trying to think of another, not, not rational people, but people who live in another world whose, whose head is in the clouds and all the rest of it. We tend to belittle and to dismiss philosophies which violate what we've grown up to believe to be true. And what we've grown up to believe to be true is what we have been taught is true. So I think this is a very, very complex subject. Be that as it may, I'd like to spend some time later in our program today dealing with Lawrence Kohlberg. But first, I want to share with you a couple of things that have happened over the last three or four days, which I, I think uh, would be of some interest. One is a posting that I put on our Facebook page a few days ago, and it was based on an article, actually an editorial, um, that was written here in West Virginia in the Charleston Gazette, which is our statewide liberal newspaper. And... Most particularly, it is focused principally on the Office of State Attorney General here in West Virginia. Our, our Attorney General, the incumbent in our Attorney General's office, is Patrick Morrissey, a Republican who replaced the longtime Attorney General in, um, in the 2012 election here, um, Daryl McGraw. For many years, Daryl McGraw was Attorney General a very people, citizen focused attorney general. Pat McMorrissey came to the state from outside the state for purposes of knocking off Daryl McGraw and the kind of support he got from prominent business people and corporate interests in this state enabled him to do it. And the fact of the matter is now in the upcoming election, Patrick Morrissey is running for re-election. He has a Democratic challenger and out-of-state money is pouring into the state in support of Patrick Morrissey and his re-election as Attorney General. 
one of the things that the editorial in the Charleston Gazette uh, from the other day, let me see if I got the day. I think it was probably Saturday, but I'm not sure. Um, talked about a particular individual who was hired earlier this year in the Attorney General's office that Attorney General Morrissey has recently dismissed. Um, this particular individual, a female, was came from an organization um, called the Family Research Council, which is a conservative organization. And this particular organization is one of the people that pushed the Religious Freedom Restoration Act that took so much of our legislature's time this past spring here in West Virginia. And we've talked about the fact that legislation was defeated at the at the 11th hour. Um, but the fact of the matter is um, what this particular editorial seeks to make the case for is the fact that the Attorney General's office has become a home to many of these people who ideologically think like the Attorney General, uh, be politically behave like the Attorney General, and once it was proven that this particular individual in his office had said some very, very inflammatory, racist, bigoted things about gays, about women, about homosexuals generally. Once the light of day was exposed, well, you know, brought, you know, once the light of day was brought into the Attorney General's office, according to the editorial, Attorney General Morrissey had no choice but to dismiss this individual for behavior unbecoming somebody who is an employee of the State Attorney General's office. And so I think, you know, basically this obviously falls into the political campaign that obviously is heating up as we move towards November. But I have done, uh, put, had program issues here at the Virtual Center previously, which have focused on this particular office, on this particular uh, incumbent in that office, Patrick Morrissey. And so I want, kind of wanted to bring you up to date on this latest uh, set of issues that has pretty much engulfed the West Virginia Attorney General's office. Also, um, a, a, one of our listeners uh, shared this information with me this morning in an email as well. Um, it is an editorial, an op-ed piece that appeared in today's New York Times. And specifically, it deals with the issues of political and civic ignorance among our population. Basically, the argument of this particular op-ed piece is that fewer and fewer young people in our schools are studying political history anymore. Few of our major universities even have what used to be called political historians on staff. That over the years, history departments have pretty much become staffed with people who buy into social and economic history, but not political history. Part of the reason for that is that many people came to believe that political history was establishment history. That when a historian wrote about the operations or the ins and outs of our political system, it was pretty much loaded in favor of the system itself. In other words, it was designed, this particular approach was designed to influence young people into particular forms of political and civic behavior. In theory, people believed political history was designed to make good little citizens of our young people. It was designed to influence 
the minds and the behavior of young people. And consequently, as a result of the issues surrounding the Vietnam War and the civil rights movement in the 60s and 70s, many of these political historians fell out of favor. And the fact is that many prominent universities, colleges and universities, once these political historians passed away or retired, many institutions refused or failed to replace them. And the fact of the matter is, what we are seeing is a generation of young people growing up in this country who are woefully ignorant of America's political history, of its institutions, of any appreciation for how this political system was designed to work. Um, we've talked about it in terms of the Federalist Papers. So many people claim that they have read the Federalist Papers. But I think one of the things that has become very clear to me over the months and years that we've been looking at the Federalist Papers here at the Virtual Center is that many people may believe they've read the Federalist Papers, but in reality, few have. And I think the depth with which we've gone into certain selected Federalist Papers and the conclusions and the meaning that we've been able to extract from those documents suggests that there tends to be a very broad, extensive ignorance about the substance and the contents of those letters, of those papers, the Federalist Papers. What this article, op-ed piece, in this morning's New York Times points out is how ignorant this newer generation is about the operation and the nature of our democracy. The title or this particular article in this morning's paper points out that many of our younger people are vulnerable to lies, misstatements, and misinformation. And we see it all over the place in our political election campaigns today. Part of the reasons it works is because our citizens are so painfully ignorant of the, our political system, how it was set up, how it was designed to run, how indeed it does run. A couple of days ago, on the 26th of August, which I believe was Friday, Timothy Egan, in that same New York Times, wrote a paper entitled The Dumbed Down Democracy. And Egan's point was essentially the same thing that the op-ed op piece in today's New York Times is making. And that is that people don't seem to understand, let alone appreciate, the nature and the operations of our political system because political history itself has fallen out of fashion. Egan points out that in the state of Texas, and he's talking about how woefully ignorant people are and how that is becoming obvious in this political campaign. He says, as an example, I give you Texas. A recent survey of Donald Trump supporters in Texas found that 40% of them believe that ACORN will steal the upcoming election. Egan points, points out that ACORN, the community organizing group called ACORN, went out of existence six years ago. during the early years in the Obama administration. Egan points out further, we know for a fact that at least 30, 30 million American adults can't read. 
But what Egan points out is that the current presidential election is indicating that even more than that 30 million of our citizens is politically illiterate, are politically illiterate. In other words, they are not politically functional. Charlie Sykes, who's the conservative radio host in Wisconsin, who's been very prominent on panel shows and discussion shows on Fox and MSNBC and many of the other political programs of late, Charlie Sykes says, quote, there's got to be a reckoning on all this. We've created this monster. We ourselves have created a degree, a level <coughs> of political illiteracy, political ignorance in this country that is beyond embarrassing. It's dangerous. Egan points out in his article, Donald Trump, who's getting so much support, brags about the fact that he doesn't read that much. He's too busy. I think what we're picking up now is information as the two leading uh, presidential candidates, uh, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, are beginning to gear up for the first of the presidential debates, which is scheduled for the 26th of September. One of the major issues that's come up already is the fact that Hillary Clinton's preparation for the debates and Donald Trump's preparations for the debates are, at least in the early stages, quite different. Because Trump openly acknowledges that he doesn't read. For example, he talks, he continues to talk about closing the borders and about stopping the flow of illegal inter immigration into this country. Egan points out that illegal immigration peaked in 2007. Also, over this past weekend, Donald Trump has been emphasizing the murder rate, principally in Chicago. And one of the things he did was point out that the cousin of Dwayne Wade was murdered in Chicago. And he's pointing out that a crime wave is taking over the country, especially America's inner cities. Egan points out that the research indicates that violent crime has been spiraling downward for more than 20 years. Obviously, there's an issue in Chicago. There's an issue in Ferguson, Missouri, of, which is a suburb of St. Louis. But the fact of the matter is, the data, the evidence suggests that many of the positions that Donald Trump is basing his campaign on are not valid. But the fact of the matter is, people believe them anyway, because people don't know much about anything anymore. An additional example from Timothy Egan's article. Donald Trump basically made the point when they when in talking about Ukraine that Russia was not going to invade it. In fact, as we know, Russia invaded and invaded Ukraine two years ago. How many people believe and applaud Donald Trump? for his, his promise of a strong stand against Putin and against Russia, when in fact he's providing, giving the general public misinformation and out-and-out -out falsehoods as part of his campaign. Egan calls this, and I've, I've marked off this particular paragraph of, of his article to share with you. Egan says, the dumbing down of this democracy has been gradual, and then this year, all at once. The Princeton Review found that the Lincoln-Douglas debates of 1858 were engaged at roughly a high school senior level. Only high school seniors at that time 
could understand the basic premises and arguments contained in the Lincoln-Douglas debates of 1858. Egan points out that a century later, the presidential debate of 1960 between John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon went down a notch from the senior level to the 10th grade level. That particular debate was aimed primarily at a 10th grade level. By the year 2000, 40 years later, the two contenders in 2000, which as we know were George W. Bush and Al Gore, were speaking at a sixth grade level. This particular campaign between what Egan calls Crooked Hillary and Don the Con is taking place at a preschool party level. In other words, the dumbing down of our democracy is a fact. Egan explains it as follows. A big political lie often starts on the Drudge Report, the home of Obama as Muslim stories. That's where these stories began. He jump-started Drudge Report. He jump-started a recent smear campaign with pictures of Hillary Clinton losing her balance, proof that something was very wrong with her physically. Fox News went big with it, using the Trump advisor and free media uh, enabler, Sean Hannity, for evidence. Then Rudy Giuliani took it over and urged people to Google Hillary Clinton illness for evidence of Hillary's physical incapacity and Donald Trump as recently as this weekend, is continuing to suggest that Hillary Clinton doesn't have the stamina to be president of the United States. Consequently, Egan says, when Hillary Clinton appeared with Jimmy Kimmel on his show, she had to prove her stamina by opening a jar of pickles. That's where we've come. And then Egan gets into climate, which actually I opened the day with today. A Gallup poll found that 45% of Republicans don't believe the temperature. Not that they don't believe in climate change. They don't even believe the numbers that meteorologists are using. They're claiming that meteorologists are lying with the numbers in order to make people think that the climate is getting warmer. And these are the people on whom Madison, Hamilton, and the rest of them based the survival and health of this republic. It is frightening. This morning as well, there is an article in the same New York Times about the level of educational inequality in this country. And what makes this particular piece novel is that it indicates some research that produces good news, not bad news. Specifically, what the research tells us that in fall of 98, 1998, and again in 2010, early childhood analysts did research 
which suggests that the gap between rich children and poor children in preschool education was actually closing. That the children of poor people were actually arriving in the first grade closer than they ever were before to their well-to-do peers, to first graders from higher income families. And this particular article explains the research. It says that in 98 and again in 2010, I want to get this right. Research, the National Center for Education Statistics, selected 1,000 public and private kindergartens across the country. And researchers sat down one-on-one -on -one with 15 to 25 children in each of these 1,000 private kindergartens to measure their reading and math skills. They asked children to identify shapes and colors, to count, to identify letters and to sound out words. They also surveyed parents to learn about their child's experiences before entering kindergarten. What they found is that the school readiness gap had narrowed by 10% in math and 16% in reading. Young preschool children actually was showing up for school better prepared than ever before. And then the article speculates as to what might have changed, what might be different. The conclusion is that there has been so much information, so much publicity about the importance of the preschool years that even parents of poor children have begun to alter their behavior some because they have become convinced by the discussion that how their kids start school matters whether in fact they start off in a big hole or not. And consequently, many parents, poor as well as wealthy, have begun to focus more on the preschool education of their children. But this is the disturbing part. The research indicates that this narrowing of the gap in learning readiness only lasts up until about the fourth grade. And once you get beyond the fourth grade, the gap begins to widen again. So the fact of the matter is, getting kids ready to learn is important. But sustaining that effort not only in school, but at home, continues to be woefully deficient. I think all of these things suggest, all of these articles, all of this research, and the reason I collected it all is because all of it seems to me to speak to the level of civic ignorance that continues to drive our political process. And let me close this subject, because when we come back in our second hour after our break, I do want to get into Lawrence Kohlberg a little bit and just, you know, make you aware of some of the some of the significant substance of Kohlberg's stages of moral development. But as many of you know, I am involved in this year's political election process for the first time in my life. I'm running for the local legislature here in West Virginia 
from this particular district in southern West Virginia, the 28th district. And in fact, I'm in the process. I spent quite a bit of time this weekend putting together the copy for a set of walking cards, those two-sided slick cards that people leave in your in your door jams or leave uh, stuck in your front door um, when you get home from work at night because they visited your house and there was nobody home. And it includes my picture and a little bit about my background and some of the position issue positions that I take and the reason I'm running and all the rest of it. <coughs> the purpose of this card being, of course, to introduce yourself and your qualifications to potential voters in the district. And beginning next week, which is Labor Day. And for the two months after that, I'm going to be spending a significant amount of time walking the streets of the district and banging on doors and ringing bells and trying to meet as many of the constituents in my district as I'm able to handle. And I have a, a, a number of people, not nearly enough, but some people who have offered to help me in this canvas effort. But in order to pull it off, I've got to have these cards, which tell folks an awful lot about me. So I spent this weekend putting the copy together for such a card, and I brought it first thing this morning to the printer. And I'm hoping that by the end of this week, I'll have something, something concrete. So in a sense, I'm running as well. I can't be a candidate for office and totally ignore what I know about the political level of the level of political sophistication that our citizens bring to this election. And so the challenge that I have is dealing with this politically. I have a number of people who are telling me that if I'm going to get people to vote for me, I really need to dumb down my campaign. I can't appeal to voters at the same level of, of conversation that we conduct here on a daily basis at the virtual center. Good friends are, are telling me that if I do that, I'm going to lose because I'm not coming across as anybody who could understand the priorities and the druthers of the people whose votes I'm soliciting. So the, the challenge is how do I deal with that? Do I give in to it? Do I challenge it? Do I conduct my campaign based on the idea that the majority of people in my district are more politically savvy and understanding than the polls and the research tell me they are? And so the challenge, the question, is whether in fact you give in to this and dumb down, as Timothy Egan says in his column, column about the dumbed down democracy. Or do you look at your campaign as an effort to educate citizens, to inform citizens of what's going on, what some of the issues are about, why my particular position is one that they should feel more comfortable with than the position of my political opponents. It's one thing to read about this, and I've been reading about political election campaigns for close to a half a century. But I have never been in one before. And believe me, the perspective is different. Because there's a real difference between talking the talk and walking the walk. 
I'm in the process of walking the walk. And by definition, that means that the talk that accompanies your walk needs to be carefully thought through. Let me be specific. What I have decided is that I cannot give in to this. If I lose, I lose. But the fact of the matter is, I can't in good conscience belittle or insult the intelligence of people that I'm asking to support me. <clears throat> Rather, as an, as an educator, as a retired educator who has spent my life trying to educate folks or bring knowledge and information and insight to folks about the responsibilities of the political system that they live in. The only way I can be consistent with that and with my own background is to continue to do what I've always done, although at a, at a slightly different level and in a light, slightly different context. What I have chosen to do is put together what I call position papers. One page synopses or summaries, if you will, of where I stand on key issues and why I stand there. The first position paper that I did, I did some weeks ago, when I made the decision to submit my name for candidacy, the first thing I felt that I had to do was get down on paper why I'm doing this. Why, after all of these years, did I decide to run this time? What is there about what's happening in our state and in our nation politically that caused me to take this step? This step which, admittedly, I'm not totally comfortable with. It's not something that I do easily. I am nervous. I so want to let people know that I intend to do the very best I can for them. And in order to do that, I am not so presumptuous that I would try to decide what's best for them. Rather, I will solicit their input. I will take seriously what people say and what people want and what people believe. Where I don't agree with them, I'll tell them. So that at the end of the day, whether I win or whether I lose, I can at least say that I was honest, that I was me. I never stopped being me. I never engaged in behavior or in idle talk or chatter that distorted what I believe and what I will do or what I intend to do. I speak to you from Southern West Virginia. Obviously, West Virginia is the only state that is totally within Appalachia. This is, as history tells us, the Bible Belt. Religion is a very important issue in this region. So besides a position paper on why I make the decision to run, what I am concerned about, about what's going on politically in this state and in this nation, and how I will deal with it, 
if people are kind enough to vote for me and, and elect me, then the next issue that I need to deal with is the issue of church and state because it's a big one in this area. And those of you who regularly follow us here at the Virtual Center know pretty well where I stand on that issue. I can't pretend to be what I'm not. So this weekend, I took the time to put on paper what I believe about religion, the whole issue of religious freedom, where I stand. Because I am going to be very surprised if at some point in this campaign I am not asked <coughs> to take a position on this particular issue. So what I would like to do, I think we better take our break because we've gone beyond the top of the hour at this point. But when I come back, I'm going to share with you. It's a one-page thing, so it won't take that long. But I want to share with you the position paper that I put together on religion this past weekend that I'm going to make available when I go speak to groups during this campaign. They always have a table where they allow you to put your cards and your information, your contact information and the rest of it. So I'm going to be going there with copies of some of these position papers, why I run where I stand on the issues of religious freedom, where I stand on the Democratic platform here in West Virginia, why I'm running as a Democrat, why I'm proud to embrace the platform of the Democratic Party here in West Virginia. It's progressive. It's liberal. I know it is. That's why I support it. And I'm going to own up to that. And if people choose not to vote for me because of it, then so be it. With that, then, let's pause and take our five-minute break. It is now, actually, it's a little bit beyond the top of the hour, more than I thought. We're at eight minutes after the hour. So we're going to pause for three or four minutes, and then we'll come right back. We'll still have 45 minutes or so left in our program today. So we've got quite a bit of time left. I urge you to stay with us. You're listening to the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution and Civic Responsibility. Five-minute break. We'll be right back. Please stay with us. And Civic Responsibility. Here's your host, Dr. Bill O'Brien. Thank you again, Agnes, and welcome to our second hour. So it is uh, here at the Virtual Center. We're at 12 minutes after the hour. And so cut a little, our break a little bit short today. It's about three and a half, four minutes. But... Uh, uh, I'm kind. Of, I'm kind of anxious to get into this material. I don't want to take too long. Although I, I got to admit, I was enjoying listening to the music. Uh, Agnes and Bob do a great job in picking music to uh, to cover the breaks here at the Virtual Center, and I appreciate that. Let me again bring you up to speed on the phone number, email addresses, and etc. Um, my our phone number is area code three zero four six six three. 4676-304-663, Horn, H-O-R-N. My email address is waobrien906 at gmail.com. That's all lowercase, all one word, no punctuation, waobrien906 at gmail.com. And again, I do encourage you to take a look at our Facebook page, just go to Facebook and type in the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution at, uh, at the top of the page, and you will be into our Facebook page. And there are a number of postings that I've put there in recent days. And this morning, in fact, um, I took the liberty of putting the link on there to an article that, uh, that I wrote. It's one of the articles that we spent quite a bit of time on here at the Virtual Center on higher education and the extent to which – we can turn higher education into the kind of economic engine here in West Virginia that our Democratic candidate for governor promises to do. Um, and uh, it deals with the Yale report. If you remember, we dealt extensively with that in couple of, uh, for the past couple of weeks here at the Virtual Center. 
and um, the article was uh, republished uh, in yesterday's Charleston Gazette, and so I took the liberty of putting the link to that article on the Facebook page. So if you are interested in looking at that article, you don't need to go to the Charleston Gazette, although you can do that. If you go to the Charleston Gazette, just look, look, click on opinion and then scroll down until you come to the articles for yesterday, the 28th day of August. And there you will see the article that I wrote on higher education. But you can save your time, yourself time and effort there by just going to the Facebook page our Facebook page, the Virtual Center, and clicking on the link to the article that is there. Um, if you recall, if you were with us in our last hour uh, before the break, um, one of the things I alerted you to was the fact that when we came back from break, I was going to be sharing with you a political position paper that I have put together on the issue of religion. Um, and um, I have put together a couple of others. I have one on why I run, and then I have another one on the progressive platform of the Democratic Party here in West Virginia, which just happens to be one of the most progressive in the nation. It's based to a large degree on some of the platform issues that were promoted so successfully by Bernie Sanders. Uh, it's a position on many of these issues that I'm heartily in favor of. But much more than the issues themselves is their focus. It seems to me that the over the driving theme of this particular platform, because it was the driving theme of Bernie Sanders campaign, was the extent to which our political system needed to shift its focus from organizations, from business and from bottom lines to people. I believe that this platform does that. I believe that the issues in that platform do that for the most part. And so consequently, I fully embrace the platform and I wanted to let constituents and prospective voters know exactly how I stood on that platform and why I stood there. So that was the second position paper I wrote written. And this the, the one that I'm going to share with you now is the third and it's on the issue of religion. I began, as I don't think anyone would be surprised, I opened this position paper with a quote from James Madison and James Madison's re re remonstrance on religious freedom written in 1785. And I selected this particular line or this particular paragraph from that remonstrance. This is Madison, quote, we hold it for a fundamental and undeniable truth that religion or the duty which we owe to our creator and the manner of discharging it can be directed only by reason and conviction, not by force or violence, unquote. Translation, and then I'll go into the paper itself. But what Madison is saying there is you can't impose truth on other people. What self-government and what this nation is about is people having the freedom to discover truth for themselves. And although we're talking about religious truth, the same principles apply. People don't tell you what's God's, what God's truth is. I believe that the creator intends for us to pursue that truth ourselves. And that's what I stand for. So with that, then, after Madison's quote, let me share with you what I've written. If previous elections in our state tell us anything about what might happen this time around, it's likely that November's House of Delegates election at some point will touch on religion. Who practices it? How often? And who doesn't? America's founders, on, as on so many issues, left us a clear roadmap on this matter. In the mid-1780s, James Madison and Thomas Jefferson teamed up to challenge a proposed tax to promote matters of public morality. Madison saw the law for what it was, 
not a serious effort to strengthen morality in the state at all, but an indirect attempt to use the people's tax money to strengthen the Anglican Church. Worshippers were not required to attend that church, but all citizens were forced to support it financially. And that's the law that Jefferson opposed in this remonstrance on religious freedom. To continue, the principal difference between the founders' approach and what our Republican leaders tried to do in Charleston is informative. The founders' formula to protect religious freedom was to keep the state out always. Republicans in West Virginia, on the other hand, did just the opposite. Under cover of barring the state from infringing on citizen rights to live according to their religious beliefs, they insisted they enlisted the state as an enforcer. And in doing so, they violated the very essence of religious freedom. Madison's 1785 Memorial and Remonstrance against the tax featured argument after argument against religious legislation of any kind. It endangered all other human liberties and is morally wrong, Madison believed. Madison made his case in no uncertain terms, quote, either the will of the legislature is the only measure of their authority and they may sweep away all of our fundamental rights or they are bound to leave this particular right untouched and sacred. Government and religious freedom are not compatible. One or the other must prevail, never both. Every man's religious freedom, Madison insisted, includes the right to discover God's truth for himself. To deny anyone that right by using government to impose your own definition of truth is an offense against God. It's likely that those who would use what other people believe or don't believe for political advantage are violating all that they claim to believe in. A serious conversation with their God is in order. Those who would use the state to impose what they believe on others are not defenders of religious freedom, but enemies to it. This subject, like others so personal and so private, has no place in a political campaign. Citizens must take note when they see any candidate or worse, a religious leader, violate it. That's the position paper that I take. I believe that Madison and Jefferson knew best how to preserve religious freedom in a pluralistic society. The only way to do it was to keep government out totally. Because the minute government takes a position, it discriminates against somebody. And the only way that nobody will be discriminated against politically is for government to stay totally out of the picture. That means out of the schools, out of the churches, out of the pulpits, out means out. That's what I believe. That's what I have long believed. And that's what I want constituents in this district to know on that particular issue. Obviously, many of them will not agree with me. But I cannot, in good conscience, adopt a position in public that I don't subscribe to in private. And so that's the position that I would that I would take. We're at 24 minutes after the hour. We've got about 35 minutes left in our program today, and I'd like to use some of that time to get into the moral stages 
explained and supported in the research of Lawrence Kohlberg. Lawrence Kohlberg was a psychologist and researcher at Harvard. And basically, Kohlberg's stages of moral development address the issue of moral judgment, making moral decisions, making the decision that is best for you in a moral, sometimes challenging political situation or social situation or economic situation, whatever it might be. By definition, moral decisions are not easy decisions. And Kohlberg's stages of moral development addressed that very same thing. Kohlberg is pretty much an extension of Piaget. Many of you will be will remember the French psychologist Piaget who studied aspects of moral judgment well before Kohlberg did his thing. According to Piaget, there were two stages, two different levels of moral judgment. Young children, up until the time they were 10 or 11, made their political, uh, their moral decisions or faced moral dilemmas that they encountered one way once children became older, 12 and up, they tended to base their moral judgments more on consequences. Uh, excuse me. They tended to base their moral judgments more on intentions rather than consequences. Young children tended to make moral decisions based on what was likely to happen to you if you did the wrong thing. You would be punished. You'd lose things that, that mattered to you or something. And what these moral decisions reflected then was a respect for authority. The assumption is that certain people, because of who they are, because of their age, because of their position, because of their wealth and reputation, whatever it might be, certain people are in positions to make major decisions. And our job is to abide by those decisions. That's the way that young children, according to Piaget, made moral decisions. To go with authority. To go with the judgment of the people in positions to know. But once children entered their teens and matured into young adults, Piaget tells us that moral decision making changed. And instead of focusing on consequences or results, older children and adults focused principally on intent. Morality was linked to your intent, what you planned, what your goals were, what your objectives were. If they were honest, noble objectives, then if something went wrong, you were innocent. Or if there was something in your objectives that was wrong, then at least you could be held accountable because you, you were ready for them or you prepared them or you anticipated them or you knew what was going to happen. In other words, if you acted in a particular way for particular reasons, primarily reasons that would benefit you, and if you behaved in ways which were not moral, that were immoral, then you, according to many people, Piaget said, would be responsible for the results. You could be held responsible, held accountable, as it were. That's pretty much the approach 
that Lawrence Kohlberg takes. The difference is Kohlberg is much more specific. Kohlberg identifies six different stages of development through which moral decision making tends to move. And basically then, he conducts research based on trying to determine at what level of the six possible levels particular decisions indicate that particular individuals are at or, or a function at. That's not a very good English sentence. I apologize. I apologize for my grammar. Kohlberg's argument is that there is a what he calls a pre-conventional stage of moral development. And what he means by pre-conventional is that it's focused on individual, on the individual. It's me, my intent, what I believe, what I want, what consequences will befall me. There's no recognition at all that anybody else is involved. It's all about you and the decision you're confronted with. That's what Kohlberg defines as a pre-conventional pre level or stage. Calls it pre-conventional morality. And within this pre-conventional level, stage one, as it were, or level one, there are two pre-conventional stages. The first one is based on obedience to authority and punishment. If a child basically acts or doesn't act in a certain way because it violates the law or violates the rules or because if I get caught, I'm going to get punished. Then if that's the reason for the particular behavior involved, then that means that you are functioning. That child is functioning at level one or stage one. That's the simplistic, the most basic level. I can't do that because it's not right or it's against the law or against the rules. And if I get caught, I'm going to be punished. But there's a second stage to this. It's a little bit more sophisticated than stage one. But it still focuses pretty much on the individual himself or herself. It's tied up with the idea that there are different ways of looking at the issue. If you look at it one way, then this is likely going to be the outcome. But you recognize that not everybody looks at it that way. The example that Kohlberg uses, which is a pretty significant example in today's world, deals with the issue of a cancer drug. And this is the scenario that Kohlberg presents to his subjects. In Europe, a woman was near death from a special kind of cancer. There was only one drug that doctors thought might save her. It was a form of radium that a druggist in the same town had recently discovered. The drug was expensive to make. But the druggist was charging 10 times 
what the drug cost him to make. He paid $200 for the radium, but charged $2,000 for a small dose of the drug. The sick woman's husband, Heinz, went to everyone he knew to borrow the $2,000. But he could only get together about $1,000, which is only half of what the drug cost. He told the druggist that his wife was dying and asked him to sell it cheaper or let him pay the balance later. But the druggist replied, no, I discovered this drug. I'm going to make money on it. So Heinz got desperate, broke into the man's store to steal the drug for his wife. Should the husband have done that? That's the moral dilemma that Kohlberg presents. The nation over the last four or five days, as you know, has been captivated by, Mil by Myelin Pharmaceuticals and the drug EpiPens, which is an allergy jug, principally for severe allergies in young children. When Myelin Laboratories bought the drug, it's been around for decades. When Myelin Laboratories bought the drug, the rights to the drug in 2007, it cost $57 to buy over the counter. Myelin has recently raised the prices to the point that now two doses of EpiPens costs around $600. And the media has been all over this. It's getting a lot of publicity here in West Virginia because the CEO of Myelin Phar Pharmaceuticals is the daughter of Joe Manchin, who's a U.S. Senator from West Virginia, previously governor of West Virginia. So many people have been speculating because at this point, the CEO's father, Joe Manchin, has been pretty quiet on this issue. So also are his Senate colleagues. Senators were quick to take issue with this on this matter until they realized that the CEO in involved was Joe Manchin's daughter. And then out of a sense of senatorial courtesy, many of, the, of his Senate colleagues backed off. And they're kind of remaining silent on this as well. But the publicity has been overwhelming to the point that Mylan Pharmaceuticals on Saturday, I believe, announced that they were cutting the price to about half of the price they raised it to. In other words, 300 rather than 600. And then yesterday, the announcement was made that in a couple of weeks, Mylan was going to be coming out with a generic substitute for the name drug. And that generic substitute would be substantially cheaper than the name brand. So as I watched this over the last three or four days unfold, I was thinking about the case of Heinz and the cancer drug that Lawrence Kohlberg uses to create the moral dilemma. So the question that everybody has asked is the same question. Should Heinz have broken into the store to steal the drugs, to, to try to steal the drug? At stage one, at the basic stage, young children would say no, because to steal is wrong. It's illegal. And you'll be punished for doing that. But then at stage two, pre-conventional level, 
youngsters would say, well, yeah, that's true. But on the other hand, there are probably people out there that would say, it's okay to steal the drugs because his, his wife is going to die. In the report on this research that I have, one, one young man, one boy, responded that Heinz might steal the drug if he wanted his wife to live. But if he wants to marry somebody younger and better looking than her, he doesn't have to steal the drug. But it's still based on the idea of what's right and what's wrong and the punishment involved. So that means it's still pre-conventional. It's a little bit higher than the basic level. No stealing is wrong. It's against the rules, so therefore you can't do it. It's a little bit more sophisticated and involved than that. But it never gets much higher. Then you come to the second level of morality that Lawrence Kohlberg defines, which he calls conventional morality. This is a level of analysis of, more, of moral thinking that recognizes that there's more than just you involved in this. There's more than just Heinz. There's more than just Heinz and his wife. There's the druggist. And so you might say, well, if anybody's going to be punished, yeah, Heinz committed a crime because he was guilty of stealing. But on the other hand, the druggist tried to rip him off. And from that perspective, it's the druggist who ought to be punished, even more than Heinz. So this is kind of what Kohlberg calls level stage three. It's conventional. It deals with interpersonal relationships. It's tied with the idea that people in a community or in, in town, in this case, have certain responsibilities to other people. The druggist had a responsibility to behave in ways that were moral. So the question is, if Heinz steals, he broke the law. But on the other hand, if the druggist charges an unfair price for the drug, he broke the community moral code as well. As one person said, Heinz was a good man for wanting to save his wife. His intentions were good, that of saving the life of someone he loves. Even if Heinz didn't love his wife, they say, he should steal the drug because I think no husband should sit back and watch his wife die. That's level three. It recognizes that right and wrong involve more than just you. That right and wrong are community issues. And that there are certain givens that, me, that make for having a community and living in a community. There's certain behavior that everybody in the community needs to follow and needs to support. Within this conventional morality, then, the next stage is stage four. This one deals with the issue of social order itself. At stage three, the thinking is, it's me, it's Heinz, Heinz's wife, and the druggist. 
and the moral right and wrong is involved in that triangular relationship somehow. It depends on where you put the principal accountability, whether it's on the druggist or whether it's on Heinz or whatever. But at stage four, it goes beyond a couple of people or personal relationships with family members and close friends and deals with the whole issue of society as a whole. The whole idea of obeying laws, respecting authority, performing one's duties so that the social order can be maintained. In other words, you have responsibility as a citizen to uphold the moral code of the community, of the whole society. And so consequently, it's the social order of the community itself that dictates moral truth or the moral code. It's wrong to steal. It's against the law. But on the other hand, once you get into the social the structure of society as a whole, it's at a level, the decision is at a level above what younger children can handle. They look at it primarily from their own individual perspective. And then Kohlberg goes into the third level of, more, of morality, what he, which he calls post-conventional. These are stages five and six. Stage five deals with the issue of individual rights and the whole idea of a social contract. The whole idea that when you become a citizen of a community or a town or a state or a district, whatever it is, you enter into a contract of sorts. You get certain rights and benefits in exchange for abiding by the rules of that particular community. And so the way you would make your decision about morality as to whether Heinz had the right to steal the drug or not would take you to questions such as what kind of a society would, be, would it be if everybody took the law into their own hands and just went after and decided to take whatever it was that they felt they needed? Maybe Heinz's wife was so sick and so elderly that maybe it was time for her to go anyway. If that's true then Heinz's decision to steal the drug was wrong. On the other hand, maybe Heinz was young. Maybe there were children at home. Maybe if Heinz's wife died, then Heinz was going to assume the responsibility of caring for young children, which was a responsibility that he wasn't comfortable with or didn't believe that he could handle. And so the fact of the matter is all of these extenuating circumstances and what ifs come into play in making the moral decision. You're aware of human rights. You're aware of the importance of life. You're aware of the importance of order, social order. You're aware of the idea of citizen responsibilities the idea of an implied social contract. And so the way you would make the decision at that level is to raise the question right at the outset, what kind of rules do you have to have in order to hold society together? But then there's a sixth stage. This is kind of a controversial one 
because before he passed away, Kohlberg backed off on level six. Instead, you, you can't prove si stage six. And so he kind of dropped it and said, we'll, we'll go with the five. But the fact of the matter is, originally he set out to, to identify a stage six level of moral decision making. And what distinguishes level six from level five is the issue of justice. The fact that social order itself is not enough. That's level five. But level six, six reflects on the fact that there are certain kinds of social orders that don't have any right to be preserved because they're not just. They're dictatorial or authoritarian or fascist or something like that. Yeah, they have order. Yeah, they have rules. They have police to enforce the rules and all the rest of it. But the fact of the matter is when it comes to the issues of justice, this particular social order ought not to be adhered to. So when you get to level six, you're into the issue of the nature of a just society. The fact that people are human beings and as human beings, they have a right to be treated as an individual with dignity. That's what we've been talking about here. We talk about the Pope's encyclical and things. That in today's world, the Pope makes the point that economic decisions are being made with what, without what he calls the moral dimension. In other words, people are intentionally not factoring in the impact of their economic decisions on people. And the Pope's argument is, no, you've got to take the people into consideration. If you make a decision that's going to affect people, then you have an obligation to speculate as to what the impact on people is liable to be. And if it's evil or it's negative, the Pope says, then that is enough to cause you to not make that decision. You need to come up with another one. And the Pope's position is that in today's world, in today's economic world, many people choose to operate in what Kohlberg would call a five-stage world rather than a six-stage world. The Pope is arguing that we must include all six stages. We must include justice. We must include the impact of decisions on people and the dignity that all people are entitled to. As I mentioned, in later, in later life and, and in his research, Kohlberg was finding it difficult to find too many examples of moral decision making that were functioning at level six. So to him, level five seemed to be the best we could hope for. Why do I raise this level? And, and again, what I'm going to say in, in conclusion here, because we're moving toward the end of our the end of our program, we're at 53 minutes after the hour. So we've got about four or five minutes at most left in our program. And this is thin ice. This is rather uncharted territory. So what I'm basically doing is throwing out questions and things that that occur to me or that bother me about some of this. I tend to be a supporter of the idea of the moral sense. As I think back on Jefferson's famous letter to Marie Causeway on the, de on the debate that goes on within him between his head and his heart 
about whether he should pursue the relationship that he has developed with her, even though she's a married woman. Jefferson lays out, his head says this, but his heart says this. I see that same issue happening here in the issue of moral decision making and moral behavior. Kohlberg is operating purely on a cognitive level. He is ignoring the heart in favor of the head. He is suggesting that morality and moral decision making is a function of cognitive process, not of innate, not of innate in an innate sense of right and wrong. I personally tend to question that assumption. I believe that much of our psychological research in today's world is based on the assumption that the only hope to improve human behavior is cognitive hope, is education and grounding in moral teaching. I believe that there is something more. I believe that man's cognitive abilities, his ability to reason, to think, to reason out options, can oftentimes overtake man's natural moral sense of what's right and what's wrong. I believe the ideal is when the two are consistent. I believe that what makes moral decision making most comfortable is, was, is when your heart tells you what to do in a particular situation and your reasoning ability, your cognitive skills take you in the, to the same place. But the question is, what happens when your innate sense of right and wrong tell you to go in a particular direction, but your reasoning sense, your cognitive skills, tells you that that's going to be in the, in the sh long term, that's going to be a short-term disadvantage to you. Oh, it might be good in the long term. It, you know, when I knock on the gate and St. Peter's making the final judge, God's making the final judgment as to whether I go to heaven or hell. But on the other hand, that's so far ahead of me that I'm not going to worry about that. I'm going to take make my decision based on what's best for me now in the short term. Jefferson tells us in his debate between head and heart that these are short-term decisions based on short-term benefits or short-term threats. But they do not necessarily conform to what's moral or what's, you know, they may conform to what's legal, but they don't conform to what's moral. I believe that these are important questions. I believe that how we educate young people can be driven or guided by Kohlberg's research into these different stages or levels of moral decision making. I think we can educate people to function at higher levels than they are currently functioning at if we set out to do it. I think that we need to educate people in cognitive decision making, in common sense, in problem solving. That's why education must include a focus on humanity, a focus on human beings, 
attention to life, to the value of life itself, to the issues of dignity and self-respect and tolerance and respect for others and the golden rule and all of these things that we throw around. It seems to me all of these things must become part of the educational process. To me, that's what it means when you talk about educating the whole child or the whole student. I think this is very, very valuable information to have. And as we wind up our program today, and I'm going to wind it up right now because it's exactly the top of the hour right now. Let me close by saying that tomorrow we'll begin one half hour later as we usually do on Tuesdays. But on tomorrow's program, I want to introduce you to a source that our friend from Taiwan, Horst, sent to me over the weekend. And it kind of ties in with these particular subjects on a much larger level, a worldwide level. But that's to come. That's tomorrow. Let me close today by thanking you for being with us today, encouraging you to be kind to each other, and invite you to come back tomorrow for our next edition of the Virtual Center. Thank you.